Hi everyone, my name is Holly Powers Verbeck. I live in Lake Tahoe in Truckee, California, and I'm grateful to be here today with Chow and for the opportunity to share my story with each of you. And I really enjoyed the preamble that opened, um, thank you Melinda, uh, because it's so inclusive of all people in the culinary industry. I, I often find that you know, chefs consider themselves this rare breed and everyone that hasn't paid their dues and, and um, you know, made their mark uh, with their work is, it, it, you know, isn't part of the gang. So um, it's really nice as the wife of a chef to be included uh, in the gang because uh, we've got our scars uh, to show <laughs> as well. Um, I, I was asked to share today about, um, you know, my, my personal experience and my journey and, um, I guess I should say that I've been uh, clean and sober since 2012. Um, that was a fateful day. And um, I guess I'm just supposed to start with a share. I, I, I guess I'll tell you that I, I married a chef in, um, in 1997. We met in 95. And what I quickly realized was that chefs are overworked and underpaid. And um, selfishly, I wanted to make sure that when we started family, I could stay at home and raise the kids. And so I got involved in the world of working with chefs because my background as a trainer and human resources, that sort of thing, um, caused me to start a business around my husband's talent. And we built that into the business that it is today. We still run Hey Chef in, uh, in Lake Tahoe. And we place uh, private chefs, personal chefs, uh, baristas, bartenders, and servers, and shoppers in people's homes for in-home entertaining. And over a period of years, I just became so immersed in, in the world of chefs, eating with chefs, visiting with chefs, hanging out late at night with chefs, having chefs like sleep on our couches, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, because we, we built a business around um, making sure that chefs got paid what they were worth and could do what it is that they love. And um, so we now have a business we've been running for 23 years in Lake Tahoe that has anywhere, depending on the season, because we're seasonal, between 20 and 70 talented food and beverage professionals that we book into people's homes. And um, so that's the work that I do. Uh, people have called me a chef pimp um, because <laughs> I, um, I put chefs into people's homes and, and I make some profit off of all the work that everybody does. Um, I've also been called um, the queen of office mise en place uh, because I do all the things um, behind the scenes that uh, chefs probably um, don't think of that need to be done, uh, don't want to do, or that overwhelm them because they really want to spend their time doing what makes them happy, which is, you know, serving people and changing lives with every, um, you know, plate that they serve. And um, so that's how I got into um, the the food and beverage side of things, right? I just like got pulled in because my husband was um, was part of the industry. But um, the truth is that um, even before I got into the chef industry, I had a propensity for and had lifelong habits of drug and alcohol use. And um, and <clears throat> so once you marry, you know, the potential, uh, you know, of, of addiction and, and anxiety and nervousness and all of that with, um, you know, the perfect brewing concoction, holy cow, right? Um, so it didn't take long uh, before, you know, my will, my agenda, and what I wanted to build, you know, clashed with, um, uh, you know, the, the world of chefs. And um, let me see if I can just read. You know, things for us really grew year by year. Things things were going well. So so when things were going well, it was okay to still, um, you know, smoke pot five times a day and drink every night and, you know, multiple margaritas on, on taco night at home. And like, like it, you can be functioning for a long time. Uh, I found I can be, I could be functioning for a long time as long as things were going my way. Um, uh, and as our business grew, we bought a restaurant and 90 days after we bought the restaurant, this is 2008, um, we took separate cars to go out into the forest and grab a Christmas tree for our family. Um, my son was in the truck with dad, um, driving in front of us. And I was with our bitty girl in a, in the, um, vehicle behind us. And it was the first night of snow. It was December 13th. 
we'd owned our restaurant for 90 days. And um, we were working hard and we were excited and we had dreams and we had visions of it. Like I know chefs have like a real vision of what it is that they want to create. And we had laid it all on the line. And as we were driving home um, in that first night of snow, uh, right before Christmas, right before our busiest season uh, in 2008, uh, right before the recession hit, uh, we just didn't really even understand the crest of the wave that we were on. Um, I watched as a approaching car slid and started spinning across the center divider, uh, the center of the road on Highway 89, some of you will know that, um, headed to Truckee and um, hit my husband and my son um, head on. So I was first responder um, to that accident in the two and a half years that followed. I remember, remember having a level of anxiety um, <laughs> uh, that occurred. Uh, you know, I, I do the business side of things and, um, and I remember thinking to myself, a lot has just changed and I could see the numbers just clicking up, you know, a $15,000 medical deductible 15 days before the year end, and then it reset again. So 30,000 in debt, like within two weeks, plus a lost vehicle, plus, 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 my key worker is out for our Christmas season where we earn 40% of our income. Like anxiety levels kind of went through the roof. And I remember telling some people in the months that followed, um, there was one week when I took my, um, my son and my husband to nine medical appointments in between running the restaurant that we ultimately lost. Um, and I remember telling them like, oh yeah, this is the thing. Like I was like, oh yeah, like this is the thing some people get divorced over. <laughs> and, and I just really didn't know. I, I love that phrase. It says like, um, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, it's just possible that you haven't grasped the situation. <laughs> And I clearly just didn't know what was ahead. And, and I, I was so used to just running on, on fumes and, and just, you know, pushing forward and just grabbing it and running with it and making it happen um, that I couldn't have seen that over the next two and a half years, my husband would be in the hospital eight times. We would lose the restaurant, you know, uh, rack up $327,000 worth of debt. I mean, it just went, oh, my son broke his back. Um, like it was, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> and you know, within about three years, we found ourselves on the brink of bankruptcy and divorce and um, really using a lot in order to numb out our feelings. And I, I guess, like I tell you all of that to just go like, you know, each of us has our story uh, and mine is unique and special and, and yours is unique and special because it's your story. Um, but what I found in terms of what helps me with my health is really looking at my story and my life and, and, and three questions. Who am I? What do I have? And what can I do? And um, there's really two ways that I can look at that. I can look at it through the lens of my feelings, or I can look at it through the, the lens of truth. And I, uh, and so I look at like truth with a small T and truth with a capital T, right? So when I look at um, you know, my story and who am I, I can look at you know, my history and my wounds and the ill teaching and uh, you know, what my parents did to me and the years of, of abuse and um, you know, the six high schools and the seven divorces between my parents and like all the background that I know so many of you chefs also um, register with and, and resonate with. Um, or I can look at who I, uh, who I know that I am, capital T. Who am I? Like, I am a fully capable human being with all of my capacities, with free will to make choices according to what can be the greatest expression of who I am, um, what can solve things, what can, like, I, I have full autonomy um, and a freedom of choice. And so if I can start with that instead of my story, and my feelings about my story, then who I am already puts me in a better position. Um, and my second question is, um, you know, what do I have? And I know that when, when, oh, when I'm not in a great headspace, when the stuff between my ears is looping and looping, I find that it's because I'm 
not talking about what I have. I'm talking about um, what I never got, what I lost, what I have that's not good, what I have that's not good enough, what I'm still wanting for, what I'm still striving for, um, what I used to have and I don't have anymore, what other people have. Like, it's kind of insane what can go on in there if I let the question of what I have and who I am be about my story and my feelings. When in fact, so much of everything that goes on in my head every day doesn't even ever take place. Like, I had conversations, I had a conversation in my head the other day while I was washing dishes with my son's wife. My son is 21 in college, hasn't met he doesn't have a girlfriend <laughs> and I'm already like letting my head future trip into like what it would be like if I had this situation and then I had to say this and what, like it's kind of insane what this brain can do if we can't keep it channeled in the right direction it's this idea of like uh, be a master of your thoughts or your thoughts will master you and um so become aware of a lot of the reason that I'm feeling the anxiety, the nervousness, the comparison, the um, the lack of satisfaction, uh, the I need to continue to work more. I've got to continue to earn this before I could feel worthy of it. it has a lot to do with how I answer those questions of who am I, what do I have, and what can I do? And so then we come to the third one, like what can I do? Um, you. I, if I'm looking through the lens of my feelings, a small, a small T truth instead of the capital T truth, I'm looking at like, well, who's holding me back and um, why I can't and oh, poor me and I've tried before and um, what do I deserve? <laughs> and uh, it's just so self-focused. I it, Truly, I found that my, that my mental health with the capital T truth is so much better when I'm not so selfish and self-focused and when I can inquire as to my feelings. And it turns out I found that I have to be sober in order to make a reasonable inquiry into my feelings. Like I have to be able to remember them and not, <laughs> and not be blacked out. <laughs> um, uh, you know, what can I do, uh, capital T, capital truth? Um, like, it's, it's all out there, you know? And when I, I, I can handle my anxiety, my nervousness, my anxiousness better if, um, if I can view those three questions, who am I, what do I have, what can I do from a place of capital T truth, not, not small t truth, which is focused on my seat, my feelings, and is really truly focused on um, selfishness, self-centeredness, what can I get, what can I take, what will others try and take from me, like it's, that's a whole mental game going on up here that is poisonous, it's unproductive, um, and it doesn't help me sleep well at night, it also doesn't help me be of service to others, which I find gives me, it gives me more joy and more peace, and um, so while I have focused many of um, the years of our business on um, you know, let let us be of service to others um, with our private chef business, I, I recently made a change and it came from some quiet reflection and prayer. And it, you know, what, what, what came about was um, instead of trying to you know, serve wealthy people and make a lot of money and, um, and, and I'm not saying making a lot of money isn't um, one of my goals, uh, but I know that there's a bigger mission uh, that I can play that gives me a bigger purpose in my life that helps me live those questions. Who am I? What do I have? What can I do? And it has to do with helping chefs. And um, so I, it, it, maybe it's a shameful plug. Thank you, Melinda, for having me on your show. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started Make Your Business Cook because I know there's so many chefs who have that dream of wanting to serve, who have a dream of their business, like my husband and I did and do still, um, and, and that we get to have with our company. And there's so many chefs who want those things. And I think one of the things that can really be um, um, 
uh, can really be harmful to our solid mental health is that it, like if we don't know what to do differently but think that we don't need to change <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think that's like like um i don't like where my life is i'm not happy where my life is i don't know what to do differently i don't want to give myself permission to do it differently it might be frightening too so let me just stay where i am as opposed you know and and i don't need to change anything because the rest of the world is wrong um and instead saying, all right, what do I need to change? And so my, my journey of getting sober, um, you know, was so that I could be aware, be awake, and start making a reasonable inquiry into those questions. Who am I? What do I have? What can I do? Um, and imbuing them with, with a capital T. Um, and that put me squarely in like change your business around, do some things to help others. There are chefs that are suffering right now. There are chefs who have dreams. They don't know how to reach their dreams. And so many people have said, Holly, just show me what you do. I like, how did you build this business? I would do it. So that's what I'm spending my time doing now. And, and I guess I would just, you know, end on this point that, um, you know, the energy that so many of us spend focusing on somebody else's life, um, is so much better when we take that and focus on our own. And we can only do that when we realize that we are whole and we are complete and we have as much right to be here as anybody else. And that the world would be a less fulfilling place unless and until we actually take on the mantle of being who we are and doing what we can and living that dream that we have. Because if we don't, like I'm nothing but a stillbirth. I, that's like the, a really offensive um, a way of looking at it. But like if, if, if all I'm doing is looking at all the reasons outside of me that I can't do what I want and what I know from within my heart and soul I'm meant to do and that I'm capable of doing, uh, then, I'm, um, then it's no wonder. That, that I have dis-ease, that I have discomfort, that I have anxiety, that I have, um, you know, inability to sleep. I'm living less of a life. Um, so, yeah, in my current life, I've got anxiety. I've got nervousness. Some of this shit doesn't go away. But I know that I'm doing my best me. I'm focused on who am I, what do I have, and what can I do? And not on my feelings and on um, on really looping around with that um, you know with that stuff about um, about uh, about my own mental health. And so I, I guess I would just end on this that you know, like um, I, what I want to always tell chefs is like you don't get to claim that you're a good person because you suffer. You don't get to claim that. Um, you, you lived a worthwhile life because you allowed yourself to be mistreated. You don't get to claim that it's a full and complete life because you're a badass because you can put up with terrible conditions. That's a half measure of life. Like it certainly is valuable to have the resolution and the perseverance um, to be able to overcome situations. All of us will have them. I've had them since the day I was born and all the way into adulthood and marriage. We're all going to get shit. We're all going to get to live our stories and they're going to be really special and they're going to test us. Um, but we don't get to claim that it's a full life just because we suffered. There's so much more. So um, there, I guess that's what I've got to say to chefs. And, um, you know, and, and I would invite anybody to call me. Um, I don't know, Melissa, if you, you know, want me to put in, um, you, you can tell me later if, if uh, you know, I should offer any free resources or my phone number. I'm available for anybody to call me anytime. Um, it's good to be operating clear, anxious or not. 